Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. So then in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Udia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's an outline there in your newsletters, left-hand side, some household questions, top right. Uh, God willing, uh, if we haven't all melted, there'll be an opportunity for questions uh, at the end of the sermon. Uh, Over the summer holidays, as Andrew reminded us, uh, we've been looking at the good life. Uh, In our wider culture, Christians are now the bad guys. In a culture where following Jesus is disparaged as out of step, intolerant and old-fashioned, at a moment when many of us might wonder, is it really worth following Jesus? It's worth just pausing and going, there's a lot of good about following Jesus, about knowing him. As we've worked our way through Colossians and then 1 John, we've had a number of short and pithy reminders of that goodness. Uh, We've been reminded what it is to be justified. You're perfect. How are you today? I'm perfect. We know that our life is hidden with Christ. We've looked at sanctification, live as you are. We have a community of grace. We must confront sin. We have an advocate with the Father. Grace and obedience go hand in hand. There is so much good about following Jesus. Well, today in our second last, we turn to our book known for its pithy sayings, Philippians, and we're going to see the goodness of citizenship, being a citizen in Jesus' kingdom. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for fans and comfy seats. Thanks for gathering together. Uh, Thanks for a building with a roof over our heads for shade. Thank you for gathering together. Thank you for Jesus in whom our lives are hidden. Please lift our eyes to the things above so that we live as we are here on earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Map point two on the outline, uh, Philippians is known uh, for its really pithy sayings, uh, really succinct sayings. In fact, uh, if you like watching boxing, you'll often notice that most boxers have Philippians 4.13 written on their gloves because they'll win this fight, they can do anything in Jesus. Well, they've made a mistake, haven't they? Uh, That's not what verse 13 is all about in chapter 4. Uh, It's actually a reminder that it's worth pausing before we dive in just to get a snapshot of Philippians so we don't write it on our boxing gloves in the wrong way. Paul visited Philippi in 50 AD. If you've got your Bibles there, you can turn back to Acts chapter 16. Paul's accompanied by a young man called Timothy who is the co-author of this book. 
Timothy is a Greek man. As they set off for this tour around the Mediterranean and then into Europe, Paul circumcises him because he wants no impediment to the good news of Jesus going out. They've got a very clear job. They've got a message to communicate to God's people around the Mediterranean, a message that came from a meeting in Jerusalem in Acts 15. The message is very clear. To be part of God's people, you just need to trust in Jesus. We don't want to put any of the Jewish law on you. We don't want to ask you to have any KPIs. We don't want to set up a whole lot of rules. No, we have come to realise, the apostles say, that you just need to trust in Jesus and what he's done. And that strengthens the church right throughout Asia until one night Paul has a vision and he's invited to go to Macedonia into Europe proper. And so he travels and he lands in Philippi. They stay there for a number of days. They meet a woman called Lydia who comes to know Jesus. They cast a spirit out of a slave girl. They get arrested. They're miraculously freed from jail. Their jailer and his whole family are converted and the authorities are horrified when they find out that Paul is a citizen of Rome. How could they treat him like this? And they apologise profusely and then make sure he leaves the premises. Paul, Timothy and Silas head off and they probably leave Luke behind, the Luke of Luke and Acts, to look after the church in Philippi. Philippi is the first church in Europe proper. It's an outpost of Rome. It was established in the 40s BC and it was populated on purpose by ex-Roman soldiers, men and their families who would die for Rome, men and their families who wanted to be an outpost of civilization in a barbarian world, men and their families who would say, we are citizens of Rome, we hold the line of Rome, we live in line with Rome. So you can understand why the authorities are horrified when they find out the poor was a Roman citizen. The Roman emperor at that time was a man called Claudius. Acts chapter 11, verse 28. He oversees an empire in the midst of a famine. In Acts chapter 18, verse 2, Claudius kicks every Jew out of Rome. And he kicks them all out because they're having fights about a bloke called Crestus, also known as Jesus Christ. And as he kicks all these Jews out of Rome, some land in Corinth and become Christians. And there we have the Corinthian church. There's a lot going on around Philippi, isn't there? And that seems like a lot of information, but it helps us understand why Paul and Timothy write this letter. They write it probably around the 50s to 60s AD. Paul is probably in jail in Rome awaiting his first trial. He's pretty certain he's going to lose his life. He writes a letter to his friends in Philippi who've been battling and who've shown him immense kindness. And in chapter 1, verse 27, as Andrew read earlier, he says, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. They're under immense local political pressure. Claudius has already shown that he doesn't like the arguments around this bloke called Jesus. People who are taking them away from the truth have come in and he wants to exhort them, Philippians 3 verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. This Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest authority in the universe. In Philippians 2, 5 to 11, every knee is going to bow to him. Every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus is the boss. And that Lord has the power and authority to completely transform any human being, completely change them. And when you step back, you realise that the situation that Paul is writing to in Philippi is pretty similar to ours. 
We've thought about citizenship this week, haven't we? If only to watch the lamb ad that comes out every year. We've spent time thinking about which boss we're going to listen to. I hazard a guess and think that many of us have had a clash of contentment or discontentment. There are levels of anxiety and competing claims on our minds. It's just like Philippi in Narrabrida Day. Uh, This is another angle then on what we've been looking at. Live as you are. Where's your citizenship? Where's your life hidden? What drives your mob? Who are you loyal to? What is so good about this citizenship, especially when we live in the greatest country in the world? And so Paul unpacks that citizenship as he closes this letter off. And there are remarkably modern issues here. Disunity in the church, conflict amongst believers, anxiety, materialism, morality, discontentment, all connected to where our citizenship is and who our king is. So we're going to look at it together now. Look there in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. I'm at point 3 on the outline. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. It's pretty affectionate, isn't it? He wants to make clear that these are brothers and sisters dear to him. And the commands that he gives are plural. They're not individuals. He's reflecting what he said up there in chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our community, citizenship, individual, we are a bunch of people together with a common identity. Stand firm in this way. Now, if you're a Christian in Philippi, you've done that your whole life, haven't you, as a Roman citizen? (laughs) Those barbarians out there, those people who won't submit to Rome, those people who are rebels against Rome. You've been an outpost for civilization, representing Rome to the world around you, upholding everything good about Rome, turning to Rome for all your problems. Now, the Christians in Philippi have a new citizenship. They have a greater boss. And they now stand as an outpost of the kingdom of God. In fact, as they stand there with the citizenship in heaven, they stand against everything to do with Rome. Rome's emperor, our king has conquered death. Rome's civilization, which kills people for entertainment, our civilization, which kills the emperor for salvation. Rome, where you can have every moral option before you, our emperor, who shows the perfect life. Their lives are now hidden with Jesus. Their future is hidden with Jesus. Their identity is created by Jesus, and they look forward to his return. So stand firm in this way. In this way is a moment to just look at why should we stand firm? Well, look at our boss there in Philippians 3:20 20 to 21. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the saviour. He is the only emperor that can take a body in the grave and resurrect it. And everything will be subject to him in this way, with that bloke in charge. But also looks forward because what does that type of community look like, a community connected with that kind of boss? Well, he then wants to tell us here, look there at verses 2 to 3. I urge Eudia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Here is a living, breathing example of sanctification. Remember Colossians 3, 12 to 17? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Be patient and forbearing. Here are the paid employees, if you like, of the kingdom of heaven arguing, disunited in conflict. And Paul is saying, get alongside them. Bring them together. Forgive, encourage, drag them to the truth. 
God's people exist as a mob that sanctifies together, encourages each other to live as we are by forgiving and reminding and rebuking and dwelling in God's word and resolving conflict in patience. Uh, This isn't a simmering community of triangulation, a community that enjoys rumour and gossip and slander and sharing prayer points, so to speak. This is a mob of forgiveness, of walking through conflict in godly behaviour together, a community that reflects the very grace that created it, a mob that says... Our whole existence is about the good news of Jesus. He goes on in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. If you go through Philippians, rejoicing is one of the most common words. In fact, out of all of Paul's letters, this is the letter that uses rejoicing the most. It's not happiness. It's not always having a grin. It's not a stiff upper lip either. Do you notice what rejoicing is there? Rejoice where? In the Lord. (laughs) You have a deep satisfaction and a great delight because you have a boss who is immovable. You have a man who was crucified and nothing will undo that. You have a man who walked out of the tomb and nothing will undo that. You have a ruler seated at the right hand of God and nothing will undo that. In the face of Rome, in the face of everything that Rome offers in terms of security, in the face of everything that Rome offers in terms of pleasure, rejoice where? In the Lord. Rome will fall. Jesus will never be dismissed. It carries on into verse 5. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. That Lord's coming back. He's very near. He will return. And when he returns, his grace will be evident. When people look at his mob and go, those people? How did they deserve it? How did they get into that community? Well, it's it's only by grace, the free gift of God. And remember we've talked about how that is the engine, the beating heart of God's people, the generosity that gives, though it isn't deserved. It's an attribute that was foreign to Rome. It's an attribute that's foreign to our world. In Rome and our world, uh, people who have a can-do attitude are held up. People grab what they deserve. People clamour for their rights and demand what is rightfully theirs. Now, in God's mob, what is it? Grace. Treating other people in the way they don't deserve. With generosity and kindness, which is unmerited. And it's to be known. That is the smell of the mob that seeps out into the world. Look at verses 6 and 7 as he goes on. He's unpacking what it looks like to be a citizen. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If There are a number of questions behind that. If Jesus is enough, if he is the unrivaled Lord of the universe who has forgiven your sins, if he is no longer in the grave, if his complete perfection is now yours, if your life is now hidden in him, the question is, is there anything to be anxious about? Moreover, when we do get anxious, because we will, we live in a broken world, don't we? (laughs) And we can get anxious about all manner of things, from rising living costs to what will the future for my children be to how will I handle retirement to how will I navigate my new knees and hip. They're not new issues. Or maybe the new knee and hip would be for Rome. But they're not new issues, are they? Imagine being a Roman citizen who's publicly said, I follow Jesus who is greater than Caesar. 
Imagine the anxiety that might bring. And the answer, present every anxiety before whom? Claudius? No, present them before God who has Jesus seated at his right hand. Put simply, it's to be a praying mob. And when we do that, what will be in front of us constantly? The peace that is in Christ Jesus, an objective truth that nothing can undo. Your life is with him. Your citizenship is in heaven. His power is unrivaled. You have all of his perfection. You have reconciliation with God. You can look God in the eye. You are restored in the image of God. That objective truth will guard you. Nothing can undo it. And it works in a wonderful cycle as you present those requests, you're reminded of the truth. And you present those requests and you're reminded of the truth and you'll be guarded. So let me just ask as a way of aside, is that who we are as a community, that kind of praying mob? It's also a mob that has a different way of thinking. Look there in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the peace of God will be with you. Citizenship is not just a matter of behaviour. It's an expression of mindset and heart and desire, isn't it? The things that God's mob dwell on. If Jesus is the unrivaled ruler, if Jesus is the one who is utterly perfect, then his mob dwell on the things that he displays, that he rules over, that is beautiful, that is pure, that is commendable, that is praiseworthy. In fact, this is the first internet filter, isn't it? It's the first Instagram nanny. It's the first TikTok sieve. Is this morally excellent? Is this pure? Is this praiseworthy? Is it good and just and beautiful? I want to speak to the gentleman for a moment here. There is much in our world that is placed before us that is none of these, gentlemen. In fact, it appeals to our old selves and turns our hearts and minds away from the morally excellent. And gentlemen, let me say that it is ravaging the minds and lives of men and women who are in God's people. And so I want to invite all the gentlemen to join me for a barbecue after church on February 12, to talk about this. A barbecue to talk about how we can walk as a mob of sanctification. It's a mob that cares for each other. Uh, That's where he turns to next in verse 10. Look there in verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you've renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. If you're in Rome and you're a citizen of God's kingdom, you have no social network. You have no social welfare. Your life and livelihood are threatened and your privileges are removed. That could lead to discontentment, couldn't it? And God knows that. Paul's experienced that, gone from being in the most exclusive Jewish private school you could imagine to being a tent maker with leather. He's had a lot. He's had nothing. And you notice that he didn't get it straight away. He has learned. It's been a process. It hasn't been a process to happiness. It hasn't been a process to living your best life now. It hasn't been a process to possessing his forever home. 
It's been a learning to be content, a deep-seated assurance that Jesus is enough. Do you see there in verse 13? He has finally realised that he can do all things through him who strengthens him. It's not a tattoo for a boxer, is it? You don't write it on your cricket bat so you score a century or put it above your computer so your investments go through the roof. It's a statement that Jesus is enough. He truly is the Lord. He has promised in his first ever sermon that if we seek him in his kingdom, we'll have all we need. That's contentment. And it spills out into what we began with. It means that we can walk with each other. Uh, It means that we can walk together. It means that we share the same citizenship. It means that we understand grace. This is the community of citizenship in heaven, standing firm in this way. I'm at the last point on the outline, an outpost of the kingdom, a group of citizens standing firm, a community known for its defining attributes, a mob that when gathered is given so many other tempting and viable alternatives and anxiety and discontentment. Are they any different to us? And they're exhorted to live their citizenship, not in Rome, but with Jesus as their Lord. So I guess the key question is, what's the connection between the two? Jesus as this boss and citizenship live like that. Uh, It's a good question to ask because it allows us to see why we live like this. I, I think the answer is something like this. We live as this kind of citizen because this man is enough. He's sufficient. His lordship lacks nothing. You see, when you quickly revise everything we have just looked at, each of them is a public statement that Jesus is enough. We can forgive each other because his forgiveness has been sufficient. We can walk in sanctification because his perfection is now ours. We can rejoice because nothing will undo his life, death and resurrection. We are gracious because he has showered us with grace. We can be non-anxious because the Lord of the universe hears every request. We can dwell on the pure and the morally excellent because that is the nature of Jesus. We're content because he's promised to give us all we need. Jesus is enough. And the life of his mob displays that. Do we enjoy that goodness? (laughs) Do we enjoy the goodness that Jesus is enough? Suppose it actually creates a more pointed question. Are we known as a community that says Jesus is enough? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for citizenship in heaven. I thank you for Paul and Timothy who write this from jail saying Jesus is enough and thank you that he is. He's enough for our forgiveness, for our holiness, for our living as we are. Father, help us to enjoy his sufficiency and live displaying it. In his name we pray. Amen. Any quick questions? Baxter. So Baxter's asked a very good question because let me hazard a guess. You'll have a day this week where you think Jesus isn't enough, won't you? How do you deal with that? Okay. Now I want you to notice I mentioned something very important there, didn't I? I mentioned the objective truth of Jesus, something that cannot be moved. Nothing will move that, but it's our understanding of that objective truth and living it subjectively in our own lives, isn't it? How are you going to move from knowing that to living that? What's the key, what are the key three things that we have learned over the good life? 
It's not, it's not rocket science. And it's not complicated and it's remarkably boring. You'll gather as his mob. You've got a citizenship and citizens gather. You'll read his word because you live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you'll do what as you do with the anxieties and the discontentments and the temptation to be morally impure. What will you do? You will pray. They are the three things that will put the objective truth in front of you daily and you will come by God's grace, Colossians 3.10, through that to be remade in his image, knowing his goodness. Does that answer your question, Baxter? 